practice defines limit. Overhead, try not to let your back arch. I know when I first started yeah. TRX. So maybe we chew out of that previously with our overhead squat So we're looking to see at the feet, knees. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we had some technology glitches, but I finally figured it out. And I am in the 21st century. Welcome to NASM Live. This is Prentice, and I am here as always with Wendy, Wendy Batts, and Marty Miller. How are you all today? Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Dennis. Of course. And in the background, as always, running everything, we have our man. Greg Esposito. So today, it's been a while since I've talked to both of you, so I'm excited to, to be back on. And uh, as you can see, I'm here. I was kicked out of my normal office space because my daughter is uh, doing remote school. So she has a dance lesson now in case you hear any other noise. Um, but we're gonna talk about home training. I wanna get out there today. My kettlebells and maces are waiting silently for me. Um, so can you tell us, talk, let's talk about a uh, simple approach to home training, some progressions that everyone can use so that they don't feel limited, uh, given that many of us still can't get back into the gym. Absolutely. You know, Marty and I, uh, we spent some time talking and one of the questions that we can, we get often was, well, what are, what are you guys doing at home with your clients? Like, what are some exercises that you found to be easy to teach, easy to cue, um, from a virtual standpoint, or, you know, if you're going to write a program to a client that they would easily be able to perform at home without spending a lot of money on, you know, equipment and, um, you know, they just, they want to get a good workout and they just, in, you know, we want to help the trainers try to, you know, kind of think outside the box or, you know, give some ideas of exercises that you could do that might be, you know, in the book, maybe some of the ones that we do with our clients. And that was the whole purpose of us kind of putting this together. Um, there's been a ton of home training workouts, but these are just some ideas and examples of things that we use with different types of modalities. And uh, that's what we're going to cover today. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and dig into it. So we, we have the challenges and we're in a position where we need to, you know, we need to pivot as exercisers, as trainers. So what are some of the challenges that you've had in your personal practices of, uh, first of all, your home training and then getting your, your clients warmed up to that idea, Marty? Yeah. So first and foremost, you know, it comes down to the model still your best friend. It doesn't matter if I have access to a gym, it doesn't matter if I'm stuck at home, it, it doesn't matter. And, you know, quickly, I think what was happening is people were just doing, you know, they were reacting and they were just trying to figure out what they could do. And they maybe kind of lost sight of, well, I'm still going to use the model and I'm still going to be able to progress through it. And that was one of the main reasons we want to put this webinar together today to go over how you can overcome those obstacles. So that's where we have to be nimble and adapt quickly. But the beautiful thing is the model will always be your best friend. And, you know, one thing I want to put in there that you took the NASM content and you became a CPT for a reason. So let's not lose sight of that just because we're out of our comfort zone, maybe because the gyms are closed, you know, we have to be creative. So we stick to the science, get creative, but also just because we're home and just because we're doing things remotely, let's not forget about the need for assessments. Okay. And Wendy, do you have anything to, to add to that, uh, to those points? 
Um, not really. I mean, you know, again, in March, it was a kind of a shock to all of us. You know, one one day we're, you know, we're going to the gym and we're working with our clients and everything was great. And then the next thing we know is we're shut down. Everyone's at home and it, it was panic mode. And so, you know, now, you know, people that have never really had to think about virtual training now needs to make that their primary business. And um and so we know that there's been some some challenges. We know that uh, there's been so many people to overcome these challenges. And um, you know, and so to Marty's point, you know, the the model is there for every individual and every type of situation. And um, and you know, that's some of the stuff that that we're going to cover today. So let's go ahead and move on and talk about some of the things that we can use to help make this transition into at-home training a little more fluid. You have technology there, there are lots of apps for consumption. Which way, how are you using these various technologies to help you drive your training? Well, first of all, for me, um, you know, I, you know, there's again to your point. There's so many different ways of doing it. The two primary that I use, um, you know, are usually Zoom or FaceTime because my clients usually, you know, they have an Apple phone. Um, but the people that have uh, Androids, they have access just to click a link and I, I set up a Zoom meeting and then we go. Um, the big thing is, is you need to feel or you know figure out what is in the best. Uh, you know, what resources do your clients have and what do they feel comfortable using? Because, you know, if you have some senior clients that are not technology savvy, it's going to be very important that you teach them, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to email you a link and all you're going to have to do is click it. And then at that point, you're going to see a video or, you know, just kind of walk them through the process. Um, you know, I think for for myself personally, um, if I am going to do a Zoom meeting, I send them an email about, you know, reminding them that we have a session, but then also kind of some quick reminders, be in an area where you have room to move, be in an area, you know, that's safe. Um, if they're going to be using specific equipment that you know that they have for example if they need a mat make sure the mats in place already if you know make sure their foam roller is in the same room so just kind of like a step by step of of kind of prep things that they'll need to be able to execute the session quicker so they're not running around the house looking for specific things that that they're going to need to actually do the workout um and then your camera views you're, you know, like that's that's the information you send beforehand to your clients. And then you yourself need to make sure that, um, you know, your client knows where they need to put their computer or their phone so that you can see them. And um, you'll see here that I have a 2D versus 3D. And, you know, if if they have a computer and they have a cell phone and they want to click the link and you have them, you know, position their phone in a one place and their computer in another, you're going to be able to see kind of a 3D motion of, of how they're moving um, at the same time. However, most people don't have that. So you're just going to say, OK, you know, what is the best way that you're going to be able to view a plank or, you know, I have a client that I trained this morning and he has a longer hallway and we were doing walking lunges with rotation. So he would turn his, his, um, you know, his iPad around so I could watch him do, you know, down and back in the hallway, but his gym was set on the other side. So he would walk me with him to the other side of the room. So again, you know, just really make sure um, that, you know, you are very open with your clients, like, hey, can you move your phone or move your iPad or whatever they're using um, just over a little bit? Or, hey, you know, that seems like it's set perfectly. Hopefully we won't have to move that the rest of the time. Um, but it's very important in order for you to cue and correct your clients that you can see what they're doing optimally. And then also that they can see you. So when you're demonstrating something that you can sh show them, they can see all of you and that you are also in a quiet space, a place where, you know, um, they can hear you and there's not a lot of disruption. Um, but, you know, one thing, too, uh, that's very important is still don't leave out the assessments. If you started training someone in a gym and every four to six weeks you need to reassess them or if they're brand new because now you have a whole new business, you know, um, platform, virtual training that you're doing. The, the assessments, as Marty just said in, in the other slide, your assessments are still your blueprint and that is still going to, you know, kind of dictate your programming. And so I think it's important that you think about what is the best way to you for you to receive that information. 
And what I mean by that is if they're a brand new client, you can tell them to video themselves, have someone hold like their phone and do squats like in, in all three, you know, three different ways um, and then send you that information beforehand. Or you can do that on your first training session, just like you would in the gym. Again, making sure that you can truly see what you need to see to, to maximize, you know, um, your results. So therefore, when you're marking it, you can truly see what's going on. and you know, if you're new, one thing that um, that I've I've worked with some trainers with, and it seemed to work, was for you personally to say, "Hey, I'm going to video this, um, so therefore I can review it later to make sure on when I'm writing your programs that they're going to be something that's that's truly going to help you." And I will end up doing my first session then on my computer and take my phone during those assessments, and I will actually record my own screen. So I can review it later. Um, again, letting them know that you're going to do that, of course. So you want to get permission to record um, just like you would in person. So there's so many similarities that you could do virtually that you still do when you're there personally, like face to face, that you don't want to just throw out the window because you're, you're changing the way that you're now designing programs or, or working with your clients. Outstanding. That's that's a really good process, and and it's good that you you brought up since we're in a virtual a virtual environment. Communication is key. You could get away with kind of walking around the client when we're face to face, but now you have to be even more expressive. It's a challenge for someone like me. So understanding that one of the things that I used to do with my my clients virtually is I I made so I have some YouTube, some videos in the annals of YouTube where I would explain this assessment and I would send those links to my clients and then tell them how to set it up so that they're able to reproduce the overhead squat assessment every time. But and then the point of that is not to do it my way, but there are many ways that you can get that feedback and still provide value to your customers, give them a high, highly impactful training session. Marty, do you have anything to add to the that? The only thing I'd add is because you guys both covered it so well is the beauty again of the model is you can really get someone a phenomenal workout with the most basic exercises. If they execute them right, you've got the right tempos, the right sets, the rep, reps, and the right rest intervals. So you don't have to really get overly creative with the exercises and start confusing people, making it difficult. I mean, Wendy and I've taught, and Prentice, you've taught the workshops with fitness professionals in there. And when they do five planks, then go to a side plank and then do, you know, all these, you know, controlled exercise with perfect form and we're doing the right sets, reps and tempos, you can get a phenomenal workout. So again, that's the beauty of it. Keep it a little bit simpler due to the fact that you're not in front of each other. It's going to be hard to always see all the form and technique. So just pick your exercises and your progressions wisely but they will still get a phenomenal workout. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing I wanted to point out too that you're gonna see on the last bullet, for those of you guys that are doing programs that, Prentice, you do this often, where you actually do like, you know, multiple programs and send like maybe a month at a time, you may have to actually do your own personal videos where you send just demonstrating if you're not using something like, you know, the Edge app or a, a particular app, that has like a specific um, video associated with the exercise too. So just know if you're gonna get really, really creative and something they're not used to doing, you may have to do some personal videos that you send along with, um, with the program in order for them to execute it correctly as well. Absolutely, and even with naming conventions with, with clients, it, it is confusing to them. That's not their <laughs> job necessarily to know what the exercise is. So it's it's really nothing to shoot like a 30 second video going just showing a visual of the technique and that is highly impactful for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go ahead to the next slide. And Marty, you started talking about the KISS principle. Uh, so let's talk about that as it pertains to the entire model. Absolutely. So again, the beauty of the model is that when you're getting ideal form and technique and you're getting the right tempos, you're maximally working that movement pattern unlike any other program they've probably ever done. So again, you can really do a phenomenal job with exercises like planks and bridges and, you know, lunges and squats and all these things that are 
you know, something that they've probably done before with you. And you're just really going to focus on the acute variables. So it's not the time to give them something that one, you haven't prepped them with a video ahead of time. That would be a great opportunity. Say, hey, we're meeting Monday at 8 a.m. here on Sunday. I'm giving you your two new exercises that we're going to be going over. And then you show a four minute video or whatever it is that you have filmed. But if you haven't prepped them, that's not the time to try to get overly complicated, excuse me, why you're, you know, trying to do it over Zoom. At that point, it should be execution of things that they're somewhat familiar with and you're just making minor tweaks. So, you know, don't, like I said, don't overthink it. Keep it simple and they'll be ha very happy with the progressions. And if you want, again, mix in some cardio, whether it's jumping jack, shadow boxing, those are very easy things to communicate and demonstrate via Zoom or, you know, some type of FaceTime, et cetera. That is really good advice, Marty. And then one thing that I've done as well that I'll challenge everyone who's listening to do is I created, and what you should do is create your own exercise library. Everyone has a top 20. You take mm -hmm. your, your, the exercises with the biggest bang for the buck in each phase just make a make a playlist in your mm -hmm. YouTube account or Vimeo or whatever it is you use so you can actually direct your client there if you're adding new exercises for the in-person session as you're suggesting. You already have that made so you can go. A lot of work on the front end makes it easy, makes for easy transitions on the back end. Yeah. And if they've seen it ahead of time, now it's easier to cue them through it because most, you know, we all visual learners it's very hard to try to describe, you know, over a Zoom or especially when you're on the screen, off the screen. So get it to them ahead of time. If you know you're going to give them something new to them, that'd be a great time to prep them ahead of ahead of the workout. Absolutely. And Wendy, what are your strategies for keeping it simple when we're talking about training <laughs> model? <laughs> well, I think, you know, um, because again, I do this, I mean, and I, you know, and I, and I've been training virtually since March and I think, you know, I've been fortunate because most of my personal clients that I had face to face did come over um, in zoom. So they are a little more familiar with when I say, Hey, let's do a YT and a, I usually step back and I show them at that point as well. Um, so I'm still showing, telling and doing for every session, unless it is something that is like a walking lunge, like they are very familiar with that. But if they weren't, again, just train the session like you would if you were in person. So again, as the trainer, your your viewpoint is going to be very important because, you know, they need to see exactly what you're doing and explain to them. Remember making sure your foot's straight, making sure you're in the five kinetic chain checkpoints and then watch them and just be very, you know, just very tuned in to their movement. You know, hey, you're arching your back. Remember, tuck under a little bit. Hey, your arm's starting to fall forward. Bring it this way. You know, just still be on it because again, I don't, you know, some people didn't change their rate and if they're still charging full rate, then you need to give them full rate service even virtually. And, um, you know, you don't wanna just sit back. But if I'm doing the programs, I have done that and I did exactly what you did. Um, Princess, I have some exercises and I just, you know, I attach those to the programs if there's something new. And, uh, and yeah, we just go with it. Outstanding. So why don't we just, why don't we move forward and get to why everyone's here today? What do we put in the toolbox? I even got several questions today. What do you do to, to work out at home? So let's talk about some of the things we can use to make an impactful at home training session. Yep. So, you know, this is the way I've always looked at it. And I was doing some webinars recently with Mike, you know, the founder of all this. And, you know, we, he describes it the exact same way is NASM, that's your pathway or your toolbox. You're going to run into a lot of tools within the industry. There's always going to be new things that come, you know, into it. When I first started training, we didn't have suspension training. So you had to learn it, but it's, it's not the only way I train. It's a tool that I learned how to use within the OPT model. So we went through some things, uh, Wendy and I put together that are easy to acquire or easy to have around the house. So that way, you know, we'll talk about what you can do with these tools within that OPT toolbox. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. So why don't we take a look at that? Let's go ahead to the next slide. This is really good stuff. The mm -hmm. only thing I don't see are cooperative pets and children. 
<laughs> That's true. I have a four year old who's, you know, who's actually pretty small. So I probably could throw him around like a, like a, a backpack as well. But, but, you know, these were some, some images that, I mean, were, were easily found because so many people are, are using these types of, of things. Most people have some sort of backpack or suitcase or something at home that they could use for external weight. If, if the backpack or suitcase is too light, then of course put books in it or put things around the house that you could to make it a certain weight. Um, you know, water bottles for lateral raises, milk jugs for rows. Um, you know, you could put the, the backpack on to do just like if you had a weighted vest or if you're doing front loaded squats. I mean, there's, you just have to be creative. And again, if you tell your client that you want them to go and buy all of this equipment right now and then still pay for your services and then they're still having to work and do stuff it, it's you know it's an easy it's an easy way to lose them so just ask them hey what do you have around your house i'm going to build a program i don't want you to have to buy anything extra at this point um let's see what you have and let me see what i can work with and then you really need to focus on trying to maximize um anything they have at home before you ask them to go outside and purchase something different that is, uh, that's amazing that you brought that up because uh, as I was shopping for a little equipment during our shelter at home, all of our big name vendors, and I like to swing some kettlebells. They're out. Nothing was available. I couldn't yep. buy anything. Everyone emptied out the catalog. So that's, that's good that you're suggesting. And there's plenty of things at home to still get, to still get a highly beneficial uh, training session. So why don't we go ahead and let's go through the model and talk about some of your exercise uh, selection at each phase. Yeah, so, you know, again, we were, we were trying to think, what are some exercises that we do, even in just the resistance portion? Because again, we always, you know, seem to, to talk a lot about core balance and plyo. So again, you wanna think about all of it together. So don't, don't think that we're, we're um, we're not doing the the right flexibility techniques and then the the proper um, kind of warm up, if you will. But these are just some of the basic exercises that that Marty and I both do. So together we were like, you know what? Yep, I do that. I do this. I do this. I mean, we were just rattling them off. And again, as you can see, you could use any of the tools that we had on the previous slide to bump it up to make it harder if you wanted to add some load. But again, we're still focusing on the acute variables. We're still using the 421 tempo. We're still maintaining the five kinetic chain checkpoints. And you know, any of these exercises would be very appropriate for someone in the resistance portion in phase one. And then the same thing when you get to strength, endurance, and power. You know, these are just some of the ones that Marty and I have done at home with our clients. And I mean, they're the list we could have gone on and on and on. And uh, obviously, we didn't want to bore you with that. But these are just main, mainly the ones that um, you know you could you could easily do without a lot of external equipment. And it's you know it's very easy to progress these and regress these as well. We just kind of gave like the main category part of it, but you know you got different planes of motion and all that kind of fun stuff as well. And, and as Wendy said, all of those implements that you can grab around the house. So you know I'll be honest with you, like the first four weeks, I kept thinking the gym was going to open. The gym was going to open, and I had a suspension trainer. I had body weight two kettlebells, maybe three different weights, some bands. And I was like, Oh, do I really need to go back to the gym? Because, you know, I, I did because I like to change the scenery. I like to, you know, do different things, but I was not bored for four straight weeks. So I wasn't running out of progressions and options, no matter what phase of training I was doing. Yeah. And that always lends itself to, to your creativity, understanding the model, you can take very few simple exercises as you have outlined there. And if the only thing you're limited by is your imagination, you'll never get bored. In fact, that's one of my favorite questions at the Master Trainer Summit. Just show me a push up progression for all five phases of the model. Yeah. Show and me you know, a push up workout. One of the variations I made, do like, especially when it got to like an exercise that I generally would have used a heavier weight than I may have at the house. You know, a lot of times when I'm in the gym, I'll do a vertical load. I'm like, well, I don't have as much weight, so I'll do it horizontally. And it was brutal because I didn't allow myself as much recovery in between. So I didn't need as much weight for like when I was doing push ups and things like that. So I was like, okay, I can just change it by the way I stack my workout. I'm still following the model. I'm just doing it the way that is appropriate, following the model and with the equipment that I have. And I got, 
great workouts. That's amazing. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've done with push-ups as well. Always ask for a true 20 rep set, mm -hmm. four to one tempo. And then moving up to uh, max strength and power, always ask for a good five sets of five. Show me five sets of five of a proper single arm push-up. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You're, you're okay working out at home for <laughs> until you can achieve that goal. You don't need weights until that, until that good, point. Good point. So let's go ahead to the next slide. And you've started to uh, bring some equipment in here. So let's go through that list and uh, let's talk about your selection. Well, yeah. So, you know, there are people that have dumbbells or again, if you can use some, some things at home that could mimic a dumbbell, meaning just some, you know, added resistance. And, and again, you know, we wanted to provide you guys with some exercises that Marty and I use mainly again in the resistance portion of the programming. But, you know, we, and again, the purpose of us actually going through this was because of all the questions that we kept getting. How do I design a program? Like, I don't, I, I still feel like I've been through the book and I'm using these same exercises over and over. And, and Prentice, like you said, it's about the creativity, but it's like, well, okay, have you tried to do a renegade row? You know, you have to have good plank, you know, um, you know, st stability. So you're still really focusing on the core, the five kinetic chain checkpoints, but can you do that? Maintain proper, you know, neutral alignment throughout your spine and then add a row and, or, you know, can you throw a backpack on your hips and do a weighted bridge versus just a normal bridge? And, you know, and the same thing, chest press variations, you know, you want to think two arms, one arm, single arm, you know, um, just, just, Think about the whole purpose of, of the resistance portion. It's unstable. However, you want to make sure it's controlled and you also want to make sure you're executing it correctly. And then just, just if you just have dumbbells or something that you can lift, then, you know, these are again, just a few examples, but things that Marty and I have been doing ourselves or with our clients at home. Yeah. And, and that's the same for all, all stabilization, strength and power. Yeah. And then you've got the neural continuum that you can, you know, work with. And then again, depending on how you want to load your workout, horizontal, vertical, there's, you know, different ways to, to magnify it. So you get the right load and the right fatigue, you know, based on the equipment that you have. Outstanding. So now let's move down uh, to the next slide and let's talk about, uh, talk about bands, mini bands because a lot of pushback that I hear from people uh, who may be used to lifting heavy weights and spend a lot of time up in phase, phases three through five is I'll never get the same workout that I can get with, uh, with iron. So Marty, can you uh, destroy this myth for us? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So first and foremost, you know, we know that people should spend four to six weeks in a phase of training, not four to six decades. And men, we tend to, you know, stick in the that phase of training for eons and then wonder why maybe we don't get the results we wanted. So of course, you know, there's a reason the model stacked the way it is. If you can explain the science, that's phenomenal. You know, if people are willing to listen, but we know as professionals, you're only gonna be able to produce as much force as your body can stabilize. And we know that you can overtrain in any phase, we also know that when you're in ideal posture, that your length tension relationships are better. You're going to produce better force couple relationships. You're going to recover better on and on and on and on we go. So, but worst case, what I've done with some of those individuals is I use this as a warm up and then let them go do their training. And they're like, oh, I do feel better prepared. And sometimes I reverse engineer it for them to where I don't tell them they have to stop. I let them play around with parts of it until they start to see the science and buy in. So, you know, I'm a big fan of the bands because I travel a lot and it's easy to carry with me. And once again, if you know how to maximize them and utilize them within the model, I'm not saying I would only want to train with bands the rest of my life, but if I'm in a pinch and I got to travel and I only have 25 minutes, I know that between my correctors, my body weight and bands, I'm going to get it done that day. Outstanding. What about you, Wendy? How are you using the bands with your clients and even for your own training? Well, I mean, Marty made some great points. I mean, I think too is remember there are so many types of bands and there's so much, you know, you've got the mini bands, which you can see in the individual that's doing the lateral tube walk, you know, that, you know, we use, you know, we, 
we think, okay, we need to do that for the outer hip. And, you know, this is, this is great, but, you know, you can also put it around your arms and do really good things for shoulder work as well. Um, there's some with handles that, you know, people can use. I mean, there's so many different variations of bands. So, you know, again, you want to, if, if you haven't really done different types of band workouts, look at all the different options out there, find something that you think is going to be beneficial for you. Um, do you like handles? Do you not? You know, now they have bands where you can actually buy um, like plastic handles and then you can just keep uh, kind of threading them through. So you can just have these, these handles, just like you would be grabbing a dumbbell instead of having a band handle instead. So there's so many different things out there, but I, I truly feel as Marty said, I mean, if you don't ever do band training, it's just another modality. So if you haven't been doing it, then, then try it, throw it in your workout. Um, and again, your clients, they would easily be able to buy this if they wanted to purchase something that wouldn't break the bank account. Um, and they would still be able to get some of the resistance portion that's a little bit more advanced than than just doing their body weight or you know into something different than than even wearing a backpack you know so mm -hmm. and just as an aside I've tested I've tested over the better part of a year one of the uh, one of the band systems that's being advertised and uh, for those doubters with the heavier tension bands it feels like I'm pulling over 300 pounds off the ground doing a deadlift hinge pattern. So um, my suggestion would be don't sleep on them. No. So let's go ahead and move on and, and talk about uh, suspension training. Let's go to the, there we go. Um, so suspension training, you know, there are, uh, you know, there's all different types of uh, suspension trainers that are out there. Um, and they're great. They're a lot harder than people think. Um, the one thing that you're going to need is some kind of, of way to attach it. You know, I personally have a door attachment. So everything that I have to do is at an angle because I don't have something directly above me where I could um, have it, you know, just to right above me. However, you know, again, it's all about creativity. And, um, and I, I love them. There are so many different exercises you could do for every body part. Um, that I've found. And, you know, one minute you think you have them all and then you're like, oh, let me try this. And you can still move in all three planes of motion. And, and again, you know, if you're trying to decelerate your body weight doing an inverted row, it is super challenging. So still keeping in mind, again, the acute variables and, um, you know, and these are just a couple pictures of them, but Marty, I know you use these all the time. Absolutely. Again, it's easy to travel with. I just brought uh, my suspension trainer with the door handle on my vacation because at least I know I had it. And again, I, I can do all three phases. And what I love about suspension training is again, that accidental exercise, I'm getting grip strength as I'm using it for upper body. I'm always firing my core. So again, I can condense my workout sometimes if I'm in a hurry and not sacrifice, but also the minor, many, many, many progressions and regressions. You start to get fatigued. You don't have to drop from a 10 pound dumbbell to the eight. You can take a a quarter step in you get and do more, two more reps and take another quarter step in or go the opposite, you know, depending on whether you want to load or unload more. So it really opens up the ability to make all those minor progressions and regressions on load. Again, there's a lot of different ways to do that, you know, with the lower body and, but there's so, it's so easy to, to get a flow going as well. So that way, you know, I can just go from one thing right to another. And now that elevates my heart rate because I'm not, setting something down to go get another tool, another implement. You could almost do your whole workout after your targeted warm up without taking your hands off the suspension trainer and or use it with the, you know, the, the strap for the, the foot. So it really makes it impactful and a great way to go through the three phases of training, three planes of motion and easy to adjust. And then you can put the cardio component in it by just continually getting through the exercises. Mm -hmm. That sounds, that is, that is amazing. I'm not, uh, I love using the suspension trainer. I, I didn't get the TRX system, but I have an old pair of gymnastics rings mm -hmm. that serves as my uh, tough. suspension trainer. Yes. And it is tough. It, the, the benefits that you get are worthwhile, but always be sure to follow the science, follow the model, and it'll get you to your goal, regardless of the, uh, the situation you're in your yep. training environment. 
So now let's talk about one of my favorites. <laughs> on we the, had to put uh, it in for you. We were yeah, on this, the, was, this was for you. <laughs> we thought we would let you just take over the, the webinar no, now. So I want to hear, <laughs> I will interject, but I want to hear what you're doing. What do you do? I know what I do with kettlebells, but what do you do with your kettlebell training? Let's take a look at that besides, next slide. Besides, they're great at propping the door open. <laughs> Wow. Wow. <laughs> that, that hurts. <laughs> that hurts. Yes, they are good for they are good for propping the door open. Good useful door stop, but they're also useful for uh, several other things. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we all talk about yeah, what, what you what use I, kettlebells for and what you like about them in what I love training. about the, the kettlebells is I think that everyone saw them at first as a power based exercise. And I saw it the complete opposite, the requirement for stabilization, grip strength, core stability. So I love it because, again, this is a tool that hits all three phases of training. And I think more and more people that I see in the gyms now are starting to use them outside of the swings and the goblet squats. I see people doing the carries and the bottom up presses and finding more neuromuscularly challenging ways to do them. And they are absolutely one of my favorites for that. So I'm a huge fan of kettlebells for sure, but it's just, I like them for the non-traditional uses sometimes then even though they're phenomenal for that power production. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you bring up because, uh, you know, we're in that, we're in that place where we want to get the dramatic, the dramatic exercises, the romantic exercises. So on, for better or for worse, the swings, snatches and all of those lifts, sell. But if you think about that, like uh, like a cooking show, the final recipe, there are a lot of ingredients mm -hmm. that go into building up that skill. And I know that you've talked about, I ha you, you have here uh, plank variations, uh, you have the get-ups, you have get-ups, and all of those things go into, as foundational movements, your swings, your overhead presses, your snatches. So, one thing that I always challenge uh, trainers to do is be able to deconstruct the movement. Absolutely. How can you make the swing hard? What look at how look at the look at the flow of the movement? Do, is there a plank in there? Are you working on your hinge pattern? If you look a little uh, suspect when you're doing a swing, are your knees caving? Are you doing a little hip sway? Then that can inform you on what you need to do. I need to deconstruct that skill to build it back up. So yeah, we we always want to start even with kettlebell skills at the at the base level skill to make sure we can do all of that properly. Wendy, what are you doing with them? <laughs> well, if if um if we want to go to the next slide, you'll actually see some of the the um, different exercises that that Marty and I do. And, um, you know, there's, there's just, again, it's as creative as you want to be. So if people are always used to using a dumbbell, throw a kettlebell in their hand, it's something different. It's fun. It's, it's a change. I mean, you know, again, it's just, you know, I think, you know, doing like Marty said, I mean, you know, the, the farmer carries, you know, when you actually have it up, upside down and you're trying to maintain proper alignment, there's so many really good things you can get out of that. And it challenges your shoulder, your core, your, you know, you're getting a lot out of, of different movement patterns. And so I just think it's, it's another modality. I really do suggest though, if you've never taken a kettlebell class, you should take Princess Rhodes's, by the way, I did. And he was my very first kettlebell instructor. Um, however, you know, I just think that, that they're just there it's it's another tool to use and i think just having the variation um you again can be as creative as you want to be in all um all five phases of the model so so i use it all the time i don't know how to answer that because i think they're great <laughs> outstanding so we haven't had a lot of questions today from our audience and i'm going to go on mute because there seems to be some stuff going on in my background but just for those of you who are listening today, put in the chat, send to Greg the favorite ke your favorite kettlebell skill, and I will do a video for you and put that up so that Greg can put on, uh, on social media. In the chat box right now, send me the kettlebell skill that you want to learn. I'll send you an instructional video so that you can start bringing this tool into your, uh, into your training toolbox. So 
while we're waiting for other questions to come through, Wendy, what are your takeaways? And uh, tell us where we can find you. Um, I think the big takeaways is again, use the model. And, um, and again, think about the acute variables. Think about the purpose because you can remember, the, remember that each phase of the model, there are specific adaptations that you're trying to achieve. And so again, think about the assessments, think about what is going to be most beneficial, but also if you are training at home and you're working with clients, you know, think about the financial situation. And so therefore be respectful and try to find out what they have at home to really utilize just what they have without asking them to, to buy a lot of things. So again, you know, you want to be very creative, but at the same time, you also want to make sure that, you know, visually through technology that you have a very good viewpoint of exactly what's going on with your clients' movements. So therefore you still remain the best trainer that's out there because you're really focusing and cueing them and maintaining proper alignment. So therefore they're going to maximize every exercise that you get them throughout the program. And then to find me, my name, you know, is basic or it's, to email me, it's my name, which is wendy.bats at nasm.org. Sorry, my dogs are going crazy right now. I don't know what's happening today. And then my Instagram is wendybats13. And before we get to you, uh, Marty, one question was, and I think that was from Roberta, uh, she wants to know, are there any recommendations about the types of bands? And I'll throw in a little bit extra is there any uh, is there any brand that you prefer, uh, and what tension should people be using? There's a lot of different brands out there. I'm spoiled, you know, working for Techno Gym, so you know we do the accessories, so I get them from Techno Gym. But if you go on uh, Amazon, you're going to see there's so many different brands out there right now, and you can usually get them in bundles. I would recommend getting. A variety because most of the brands have a similarity between the colors and the thicknesses but once in a while you'll find that you know somebody's mediums a little bit heavier or lighter so I like to have an arsenal of them only because if I'm doing a lower body exercise I might need a thicker band compared to doing something for my rotator cuff so if I'm gonna make the investment you know I usually I have probably about 10 or 15 different bands just because you know it gives me that much more variety but I, I don't I can't say I have a favorite uh, band, brand of bands. That's hard to say. <laughs> okay. And uh, even though it's up there, yes. uh, Marty, tell us how we can get in touch with yes, you. Absolutely. So to get a hold of me, it's marty.miller at nasm.org. And then Instagram is dr.martymiller72. And my key takeaway, probably like almost what I say every week, is the model's your best friend. Don't overthink it. Learn it. Use it. And then just apply the tools that you're comfortable with and you know you can teach well and you're going to get even better results from the model okay thanks a lot and uh roberta says thank you and thank you for uh jumping in and listening with us today watching us today uh roberta roberta uh just looking at the polls here the comments it looks like i'm going to be doing a video of kettlebell snatches and cleans and jerks. Nice. Uh, before I do this, before I put and my Turkish getups is on there too, by the way. Well, there's a little <laughs> more heat for snatches, and I think I already did a video for Turkish getups. Uh, if you want to, if you want to see an extra Turkish getup video, I'll be happy to do one for you. Uh, just let me know. Show me uh, hands in the box, and I'll do a Turkish getup video for, video for you as well but I will send that to you and you should have them by next week. And I wanna say thanks to everyone who joined us today. Thank you, Wendy and Marty. It's uh, good to be back together. I know we had a few weeks off. It's good to share time with you and, and learn things from you. And Greg, great to have you running the ship, driving the ship. Uh, so everyone have a good afternoon, stay safe, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.